Welcome to Celebration. Thank you for joining us again. I hope it's again. If uh, this is your first time with us, welcome aboard and uh, take yourself back on the YouTube channel and look at some of our previous messages. In fact, we just finished a series. Uh, some of the rest of you may need to catch up as well. The series was on for such a time as this, and we looked at several different circumstances that you could be in, different ages, different eras, uh, just the moment of uh, the timing that God has you right where He needs you if you'll be obedient and follow Him. He wants to do some great things. So check those out. Before we start a whole new series, since today is Halloween, uh, I thought we would just address that. Now, obviously, Halloween is not a church uh, holiday. Uh, it's not even something we necessarily promote. Uh, but our culture does, and our kids are involved in it. And we want our kids to know that we love them and we care about them. So we do a trunk or treat thing at our church. Uh, but that's not what this message is about. It's just the idea of the trick or treat. The fact that you have some choices there. Now, Halloween, uh, technically, this is the Halloweener. Uh, saying, give me a treat or I'll trick you somehow. Uh, so the trick or treat is actually coming from the kid. Whereas uh, in biblical terms, when we're offered a choice of good and bad, uh, the choice is up to you whether you want to take that. And we're going to look at that. Uh, God offers some things in life. And what I really want us to see is that it's really up to you. Uh, whether you get the tricks of the devil or the treats of God, it's your choice. And it always has been. And so we're going to look at an Old Testament passage that spells it out very clearly. And then we'll just shore that up with a couple of verses in the New Testament about reaping what we sow. So we're going to think about this idea of trick or treat, something bad, something good. I also noticed, just to throw this in there, that Normally, when we give a choice like that, we always say the good first and then the bad. Life or death. It was a life or death situation. Uh, good or bad. You need to make your choice. But with Halloween, it's trick comes first, trick or treat. I'm not sure if that means anything or not. I just noticed that it's kind of the opposite of the way we always talk. Anyway, we're going to look in the Old Testament at Deuteronomy chapter 30, and we're going to look at these two options and uh, talk about what it really means to choose the right way. So in Deuteronomy 30, beginning with verse 11, the Lord speaking sent through Moses says, For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, and to keep His commandments, His statutes, and His judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess." But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. Then in the New Testament, uh, in Galatians chapter 6, a couple of verses tell us that uh, it's really up to us, but know that whichever way you choose, that's the way it's going to go. You're going to reap that. So here's what it says. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And so he's just uh, reiterating here what, what Moses was saying that God was saying way back a long time before this. The choice is yours to make. Make the right choice because you're going to reap what you sow here. And so he says, I'm setting before you life and goodness. Another passage in Deuteronomy says blessings and cursings. So he said, I'm giving you the choice. You can be blessed. You can be cursed. You can have good. You can have evil. You can have life. You can have death. But you choose. But understand what that means. And I think it's good for us to do that. So let me suggest some areas here that we could think through to realize just exactly what it means to make that right choice. 
Because I think if you just put it out there and said, hey, you can choose life or death, well, everybody's going to say, I'll take life. You can say, uh, you know, you can have good or evil. Oh, I'll go for the good. So you can choose to obey God or not. Okay, I'm going with God. But just to say it is not a real choice. And we need to understand that, what it really means to choose God, because that's what it hinges on. If I truly choose God, then I will reap the good. But to just say so doesn't make it so. In fact, many people today who call themselves Christians have already made a choice according to surveys, and nearly half of them do not believe that the Bible is really the inspired Word of God, or at least not all of it, and they're not sure which parts are. So let me ask, how can you say you choose to follow God and you don't have anything to go by? How can you be following God if you don't even know that he's given us a, a Bible to read? Uh, he's not given us any directions if that's the case. And so you're just going to follow God on your own, right? You're just going to do your own thing and claim that that's following God. And that's what we see in our culture today. Everybody just doing as they please, blaming it on God or blaming it on the Bible or justifying it by the Bible and, and not really accepting who God is, and how He has revealed Himself to us. So the first step of this would be to recognize the truth. To recognize what it is and that it is true. Uh, he said to the Israelites back then, this, if you really paraphrase this kind of wild, he would be saying like, this is not rocket science, folks. This is simple. You don't have to go up into the heavens and, or pay somebody to go up there and try to bring down the Word of God to you. You've got it with you. It's not across the ocean where you've got to send somebody over there to bring it back so you can read it, he said. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. It's in your life. It's there. Folks, you've got the Bible. You've got it in your phone. You've got it on the Internet. You've probably got the book at home. It's still the best-selling book there is. Probably not the best read book. But it's the best-selling book. We've got it on the radio. We've got it on the television. There's a church on every corner in America. We've got the truth there. It's available and it's apparent. That's what God was saying. This is not something that you've really got to work hard at. Now, let me say that there are parts of the Bible that we struggle understanding completely. Some of it's future. Some of it's in the beginning and we didn't get a lot of details about it. So... We're not sure about all of it. Uh, but there is so much in the Bible that is so black and white, so clear, so obvious, so easy to understand. If you and I would just get busy and do all the things we do understand about the Bible, it would take care of things. It would take care of our lives. It would take care of our future. And it probably would help us understand some of the other things because we'd be so close to God. And that's what he started off telling them is, you've got the truth. You've got my word. You've got my teachings. You've got my principles. It doesn't take a lot to figure them out. They're right there, plain and simple. Just do them. Not only is it available, it's tried and true. Now, you might argue and say, well, I just don't believe that it is the inspired word of God. That doesn't change the fact that for 2,000 years it's been accepted as that. For 2,000 years, it's been proven over and over and over and never been disproven. For 2,000 years, people have lived their lives by it, and it's tried and true. And if you be honest, perhaps you've even experienced it, but for some reason you've let the culture sway you away from it. You've decided that maybe the culture's right. Let me tell you something about this culture. It's no different than any other culture in the sense that it's always changing, and therefore it's always wrong. If you're right, you don't change. So if the culture is different now than it was 10 years ago, why would you say that it's right now? That means it was wrong before, and it changed from something before. I mean, it's constantly doing Yet the Word of God never changes. And not only is it tried and true in, in most of our lives, but it never changes. Because God never changes. And that's an interesting thing if you think about it. God's principles have never changed, and yet, when applied to your life, they're life-changing. They're all about change. They're all about changing us to His way of thinking. The Bible teaches us clearly that normally His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. They're way above us. 
And we can't reach up to his thinking and we can't reach up to him, but we don't have to because he's reached down to us. And he's brought his spirit, he's brought his word, he's brought his people, and he's touched us with the truth. And if we'll allow it, the truth will change us. He said, it's handy. It's right here among you. It's clear. It's as plain as the nose on your face, we used to say. It's evident. God made himself evident in creation. You can read it in chapter 1 of Romans. And yet, the creature, man, turned her backs and said, I don't believe it. I'm going my own way. There again, the culture trying to change the word. Trying to reject the word because it doesn't fit what they want. And you and I have to be careful or we're guilty of the same thing. Recognize the truth. Understand that when God has spoken, it is God indeed, the one and only true God. And he inspired people to write down his revelation of himself to us. And therefore, it is true, it is reliable, it is authoritative, and it's the only thing whereby we should govern the principles of our lives by. Recognize the truth so that you can now make the choice. At least be intelligent enough and, and have the integrity to read it and say, listen, this is the Word of God. Now, do I want to go by it or not? And that's where we come to our choice today, trick or treat. Blessings, cursings, life, death, they're choices, and the choice is yours. But make it based on whether or not this Bible is the book that it says it is. Don't even factor in what the president says, what Congress says, what the public school says, what the newspaper says, what the internet says. Who cares about all of that? Did God say it or not? Is this book reliable or not? And what do you really feel in your spirit about it? If you're a Christian, you should understand it. If you're trying to decide if there even is a God and whether or not uh, that's Jesus Christ and I should put my faith in him, then reach out. Reach out and, and ask him to reveal himself. Uh, search the scriptures with some integrity. And don't let the culture sway you. Uh, they've got an agenda. And their agenda is anti-God. And so first you recognize the truth, then there's your choice. Respond with obedience. Am, am I going to do this or not? Now, let me suggest some areas here for you that if you have that kind of faith, if you're willing to express your faith that God is real, the Bible is real, and, and so I'm going to have a relationship with God if he'll let me. Understand what that means. You can't have God without his principles. If you're going to have a genuine experience and relationship with God, it will be a principled faith, first of all. It's going to be based on the Bible, on the Word of God. You say, well, I don't believe it is the Word of God. Then you can't have a relationship with him because he says it is. How else are you going to even know? If he hasn't revealed himself to you, then you can't expect to have a relationship with him. And you won't know how to live your life. And if you're going to live in a relationship with him, you have to know that. So it makes sense that in some fashion he's had to reveal himself and what he expects from his people. And he's laid down the principles. We just read it in Deuteronomy. He said, listen, I'm telling you today, choose to love the Lord your God. And if you do that, he said, it won't just be a feeling. You're going to obey my commands. You're going to obey my statutes. And my judgments. You're going to go with God's principles. You can't have a right relationship with God on your own principles. It just won't work. It can't work. God is right and righteous and holy and perfect. And he's God. He can't come down to your level and, and still be God. He's got to try to bring us up to his level. So it's a principled faith. When you read the Bible, you're going to have to read it from the standpoint that this is what God says. Make your choice there. And then you've got to choose, okay, am I going to go with it or not? Am I going to believe what it says? Our culture today, and even it's, it's invaded the church, is to read the Bible and just say, well, I don't like that passage, so I'm going to throw that out. And that's old. That's what Paul said. That's what David said. Why, Deuteronomy, that's what Moses said. We don't have to go by what Moses said 6,000 years ago. Moses didn't say it. God said it. They're God's principles. And if they're God's principles, they're right, 
and you have to do them or you reap what you sow. The principles lead to a practice faith. If I accept the principles as those from God, whether I like them or not is not the question. If they're God's, I've got to obey them. To obey them then isn't just to feel good about them. It isn't just to say, oh yeah, I agree, and then go about our own business. It's to put them into practice. I just thought about a passage in uh, the New Testament where Jesus described two sons. The father told the, these two sons to go out and, and do some work on the farm. And the one said, I'm not going to do that, and he left. The other one said, okay, I'll get right on that. I'll go do that, and he left. Well, the one who said he was going to go do the work changed his mind, didn't do any of it, just loafed the rest of the day off. The other son who said, I'm not going to do that, he had a change of heart, and he went out and did it. Which one was obedient? Not the one who just said so. <laughs> it was the one who said differently but changed his heart, changed his mind, the one that put it into practice. It isn't enough to just say, I believe in God. You know, the book of James tells us the devil believes in God. I mean, he used to be in heaven with him until he rebelled and was kicked out. He knows there's a God. He knows God's more powerful. He believes in God in his head, but he hasn't committed his life to him. He's not going to respond with obedience. He's not going to practice God's principles because he's rejected him as his God. You've got to put the principles of God into practice. And as you do that in obedience, you are making those right choices that God says, I'm going to give you life. I'm going to give you good. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to work things out for you. You've got to put it into practice and keep putting it into practice. It needs to be a persistent faith. Uh, we're not perfect. I don't claim to be. My church doesn't claim to be. We know better. But we're going to keep working at it. And when we fall, we're going to get back up. And we're going to confess to God and we're going to keep going. So when I say persistent, I don't mean every single moment of every day. That's the goal. But we know better. We've got the old nature and we're going to, we're going to fail. We're going to trip and fall. To be persistent means you get back up and try again. You keep working at it. You keep plugging toward the goal here. And so to have a persistent faith, that is one that continues to put it into practice. You don't change with the culture. You don't change because it's a different season. If it's right, it's right. It'll always be right. If it's wrong, it's always going to be wrong. God's word is consistent. and We need to be persistent as we live it out. Respond with obedience is what God said. I'm putting it out there in front of you, he said. You've got my word. You know my principles. You know my statutes. You know my judgments. Choose this day what you're going to do. But understand this. You don't get to make your own choice, choose wrongly, and then expect me to bail you out. This is a, it truly is a life or death situation. This is a heaven or hell situation. This is a good versus evil situation. And you can't choose to do it your way and then at the end say, okay, God, now you've got to bail me out because, well, I guess I messed up. No, you choose God and you continually choose God. And no matter what the culture says, the Bible still says some things are wrong. So they're still going to be wrong even though the culture has changed. them. Even though they changed the laws and said, well, now it's okay. No, it's not okay. If God says it's wrong, it's still wrong. All the laws in the universe are not going to change it as long as God's laws say no. Or the converse of that. If God says it's right and you need to do it, even if the culture says, no, don't do that. You don't have to do that. God says do it. Persistent. Keep it up. Keep the faith. Take God's principles. Understand them. Put them into practice. And keep putting them into practice. And when you slip up, you confess it, which is another one of his principles, and he forgives you, and you jump right back in the mix. Persistent faith. Respond with obedience, God said. I'm putting it out here for you. You make the choice. Don't choose your own way and then blame God for the outcome. Don't choose your own way and then blame the culture. You don't have to go with the culture. You don't have to follow what mankind is saying and doing. You can read it for yourself, God said, and make the choice yourself. And then he says, as we read in Galatians, though it's many other places, you're going to reap what you sow. But if you're doing what God says, 
if you're responding with obedience, then you're going to reap that. And of course, that's where we go from response. Respond with obedience, and then you can reap the benefits. Now, you're going to reap the judgments the other way, but I just want to talk about the good part here. I'm going to assume that you've got enough sense to choose life and good over death and evil. I'm going to assume that we've got enough sense to choose blessings instead of cursings, heaven instead of hell. It's interesting. You see people post and you see people make comments and you hear people say, well, if he's a loving God, why would a loving God choose to send people to hell? That's not the case at all. The question is, why would people choose hell over a loving God? You make the choice, not God. He's put it out there and said, you can have either one, but you will get the consequences of your choice. So you already know you, the consequences is corruption. The consequences are hell when you choose the other. Let's, let's don't do that. Let's reap the benefits of the right choice. I'm going to assume that having heard this and read this and getting into the Bible, you're going to say, well, it's pretty clear what God says and what he expects, and what he wants, even what he deserves. So I'll choose that. Then you can reap the benefits. When he said life and good, here's something he was talking about. First of all, spiritual life. Uh, obviously, you've already got physical life. You say, well, is he talking about it? He's gonna, I'm going to feel good all the time? I'm going to be well? I'm never going to have diseases? Never going to have accidents? No. He's never promised that. When he talks about life, he's talking about spiritual life. You can read it for yourself in John chapter 3. A Pharisee named Nicodemus came to Jesus one night, wanted to talk to him. He understood that people are following him, and uh, his teachings seemed to be powerful and good, and, and so he must be a good man. Wasn't sure if he came from God or not, but he came to question and find out. And Jesus began to ex explain spiritual matters to him. And he told Nicodemus that with all of his religion, it wouldn't matter, that he would not see the kingdom of heaven unless he was born again. And Nicodemus said, how could an old man like me enter his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus said, I'm not talking about physical. I'm talking about a spiritual life. Physical life's no big deal. You don't have to do anything to get that. Your mom just births you, you know. Spiritual life. You have to make a choice to choose to follow God. And then he gives you a new life, puts a new spirit, his spirit, his heart into you. And you get spiritual life. That's the first and, and foremost benefit because none of the rest of it works if you don't have that. Other blessings, other good things in life don't matter at all if you don't have a spiritual life given you by God the Father. But he says you can have that. You can choose it. He's offered us forgiveness, pardon, the indwelling Holy Spirit, God himself to go with us through every step of our life. An understanding of spiritual matters, the Bible to guide us, the power of God in our lives. He said, all you have to do is choose, but you have to make the right choice. The New Testament is very clear what that is. It's Jesus Christ. I had a funeral this afternoon, and I pointed out in John chapter 14 that Jesus said, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. And the man whose service we were doing, had done that. So I have no qualms about where he's at. Jesus was saying, if you trust me, I'll take you to heaven someday. If you trust me, you can be born in a spiritual life. But he also told us in John that I came not just to give you life, but to give you abundant life, that you might have it more abundantly. Now, be clear, because the Bible is, that a man's life is not abundant because of the things that he might amass. It doesn't, you don't get abundant life by having a lot of possessions, a lot of money, a lot of power in this world. That's not abundant life. Anybody could have that. The most lost man in the world could have that. People who just totally don't believe in God could have a lot of that. That's not where abundance lies. It lies in fulfillment. It lies in satisfaction. It lies in a knowledge and a peace in knowing that you're being the kind of person God has called you to be. The abundance comes in the quality of the life. The abundance comes in the fact that God gives you spiritual blessings and rewards later even. Uh, and so the abundant life isn't about stuff. It's about a relationship with God that's 
filling and, and, and its fullness. And it's knowing and having peace and joy and knowing that your life is where it ought to be because you're with God and living it His way. Doesn't mean that every single thing you do will appear to be successful because you and I define success so many times in the wrong way. We get caught up in numbers. Um, how many people got saved? And how many people got baptized? And how large a church congregation do you have? And how many people showed up? And, and how much money do we have in the bank? And how much do you have? And what have you got? And we get all wrapped up in the wrong things when it's really about the quality. And it's about how we feel toward God and He feels toward us and the relationship that we enjoy. And yes, the power that comes from knowing God and being in an obedient relationship with Him. And He gives us the life and the goodness and the blessings instead of the cursings. And that makes it an abundant life. We had a sermon series last year on the Beatitudes and talked about it meaning that we are blessed if we do these things, which meant we are at one with God, satisfied with a life and relationship with God. That's an abundant life. And that's one of the benefits. You get the spiritual life first. Then as you follow in obedience and live for Him, it blossoms into an abundant life. And then He said, as we read Galatians, everlasting life, eternal life. You're going to live with Him forever. The choice of heaven or hell the choice of life or death is really about quality. You realize that every single person was created to be an eternal being. Our soul lasts forever. God made us that way. The question isn't about how long you would live. We're all going to last forever and ever. The question is the quality of life. And we, the Bible talks about eternal life as the quality where we spend it with God forever in heaven. And we have all the blessings and none of the cursings. Whereas hell, the alternative is described as an eternal death. It's like dying but never getting there. Because there's nothing good there. Because God's not there. God has said, not just to the Old Testament Israelites, but to me and to you. See, I've placed before you life or death, good or evil, blessings or cursings, treat or trick. Which one do you want? Well, any Halloweener would take the treat. Any person dishing out the treats would love to just give you the treat and not get a trick. Nobody wants the tricks. Nobody wants the bad stuff. Then why would we choose it? We have a world full of people choosing to go against God, choosing to take their chances, choosing everything that's wrong. And it has to come down to this. They just don't want to choose God. They want to do it their own way. You're free to do that. But not without suffering the consequences. You reap what you sow. God says if you'll sow life to the Spirit, you reap eternal life, abundant life, spiritual life. The blessings of knowing that God's in your life and in control of your life and your eternity. You choose. Which would you take? It matters, and it matters forever. Let's pray about it. Father, we thank you that uh, you've made it clear. You've given us everything we need to make a right choice. You've spoken to us through creation. You've spoken to us through conscience. You've spoken to us through the written word. You've spoken to us through sending your son here to live in front of us and give us written word about that. Your spirit deals with our hearts, and you've made it clear and plain. It's right there. God, help us choose not only for salvation but for our daily life to have a principled, persistent, practical faith because we've chosen to be obedient and follow you because you alone are God and we thank you for that blessing and privilege to be a part of your family and your kingdom. I pray someone hearing today might make that choice as well and reap all the benefits. Thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.